great panel here on set as well to discuss what is going on up on Capitol Hill. Elizabeth Wider, Elizabeth Wider is a legal expert and president of the Constitutional Accountability Center. And Jonathan Turley is a professor at George Washington University Law School who recently testified to Congress. Jonathan, let me start with you because you testified for the Republicans up on Capitol Hill that you felt that, uh, th that the impeachment process itself uh, perhaps needed more time and you weren't convinced uh, that this rose to the level of an impeachable offence. Is that an accurate summary well, actually, of your... The outcome actually mirrored the testimony. The four crimes that I testified against were dropped by the Democrats. And then the two that I said were legitimate actually are the two that they adopted. My problem is not with the theory of these two uh, articles of impeachment, it's the record. Uh, this record is incomplete. It is not sufficient. And it will fail in spectacular it's fashion. It's because we haven't heard from witnesses or because the evidence doesn't exist or we don't know. No, there's evidence. It's just, it's primarily inferential evidence, which is what the, my co-witnesses said, is they said you can base this impeachment on inferences. But you don't have to. This is a very thin record. If they took a couple more months, they could, I think, get some of these witnesses. In the Nixon case, it took three months to go from the critical decision of the trial court to a final decision of the Supreme Court. That's an expedited appeal. They could get more rulings. They could actually support this case. So they have a choice. They could keep their pledge to impeach by Christmas and fail, most certainly, or they could wait and build a real case in the next couple of months. I suppose, Elizabeth, the counter-arguments from Democrats is we could wait and we could try and get Mike Pompeo and we could try and get the former National Security Advisor John Bolton, we could try and get the Acting Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney, and we could have them all in the House and we could try and get them to testify if the White House would let them, assuming the White House mm. would let them go and testify. But the Senate is never going to impeach the president anyway, even if that case is built with more evidence and with more direct knowledge of those conversations. Well, it certainly seems from comments that we've heard from Leader Mitch McConnell or Senator Lindsey Graham that no amount of factual record would be able to sway their opinion. They seem intent on putting their party over the Constitution, over the country in this instance, which is incredibly depressing. Um, you know, I think the record is actually incredibly clear in part because President Trump is his own smoking gun. You know, we have people who are directly involved with withholding the aid from the Ukrainian government and knowing that there was a quid pro quo like Ambassador Sondland who testified. So I think the record is quite clear. And the facts themselves show that what we're talking about here as an impeachable offense goes to the heart of what the founders of this nation were concerned about when they wrote impeachment into the Constitution as a remedy. In particular, the foreign corruption of our democracy, undermining the Americans' ability to have faith in a free and fair democratic process, and then, of course, putting himself above the law by having not just here or there a pushback on certain executive privilege matters, but a blanket refusal to cooperate with the House's legitimate oversight authority. That's the Democrats' argument, isn't it, Jonathan Turley, that they can't afford to wait very much longer because this is a national security issue and because the president's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, has actually been in Ukraine as recently as last week, still trying to dig up dirt. Well, on the president's it, opponents and potentially yeah. getting invo getting Ukraine involved in the democratic process of the United States. Well, it's a curious argument that we have to rush so this could fail as quickly as possible because that's what that argument is. The reason is they're making this easy on the White House because they haven't actually tried to compel these witnesses to testify, the ones that have direct mm -hmm. testimony. They've made it easy. So the Senate majority can simply say, look, you say this record is so overwhelming, fine, we'll give you a trial on the record. You didn't call these direct witnesses? You didn't go to court to compel them? Fine, we'll have a trial without them. And so they've set this up for failure. If they had simply waited a couple of months, they could have gotten courts to rule on compelling these witnesses. Then they would have a real obstruction of Congress case. And many of us are just baffled. If they simply waited until April, they would have twice the case they have now. And I disagree that just because the Republicans control the Senate, it is guaranteed that they will not switch sides. Two-thirds majority, you think in, you'd manage to get in our history, enough Republicans to overcome In that? our history, we have seen senators break with their party. And even if it not didn't Not in see, recent history, not in Donald Trump's Republican Party history. Well, 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 you have Leader McConnell saying he won't be an impartial juror. I think that that's, you know, using their own words as the guide, I think is where we get into trouble. And I think that even if we added more and more and more evidence, even when we had 
more direct evidence, because there actually already has been direct testimony from people like Ambassador Sondland and President Trump, who says there's absolutely nothing wrong with his phone call. You know, he's probably the only one who's being honest uh, or real about the fact that this happened, but he just doesn't think it's impeachable. And that, I think, is, is a different point. I think that's part of the problem with this, is everyone comes to this movie and hears the lines they want to hear. And the fact is, Democratic senators have also said they made up their mind. Democratic senators have already started talking about what a shame it will be not to convict Donald Trump before he was impeached. These are political animals. I did the last trial in front of them. I would strike them all for cause. They're a horrible jury for any lawyer to have. But they're the only jury that can remove a president. But they have surprised people. Even if you don't succeed in removing this president, it would make a big difference if you presented a strong case where some might have crossed the line, might have joined Democrats. But the House has made that virtually impossible by presenting the thinnest record ever submitted to the Senate. Elizabeth, uh, in the country's 250-year history, we've had three impeachments. Two of them have been since I've been living in Washington, D.C. I'm either very, very old, which is quite possible, Not true. or impeachment is becoming more common. Which is it? Well, I think it's still extremely rare. I mean, three times, even though two have been relatively recently, um, is still very rare. And, you know, I think that perjury, of course, it's against the law. It's bad. Lying about um, an affair with an intern was very bad. Um, you know, soliciting foreign interference in American democracy, I think, gets to the heart of why impeachment is written into a, the Constitution as a remedy, in part because it gets to the question of whether the ballot box can be the effective check on our elected leaders that it's supposed to be. And if we have foreign interference undermining our free and fair elections, then as the founders specifically worried about, we won't be able to properly check our elected leaders because our democracy will be undermined. So I think that the House had to act. I think there's a strong case. And I think if we don't act, if we don't as a nation act now, Democrats and Republicans, and I agree, we should hold out hope that the Senate does the right thing. But then we could have a, a situation where the 2020 election is not the free and fair election that our Constitution promises. Elizabeth Wydra, Jonathan Turley. Professor Jonathan, thank you very much for coming in uh, to join me on this very uh, important day. And we'll get more analysis, of course, during the course of the evening, because this vote, we reckon, is about still about two hours away, right. your guess, mm -hmm. two hours away. Exactly. It's going to be a long day here in Washington. Impeachment, as we said at the beginning of this program, is not a quick process. You're watching BBC World News. To Congress, let me start with you, Jonathan Turley, and a little bit of context and history here. When Bill Clinton was impeached, and you testified during those hearings as well, which suggests both of us have been around for too long, <laughs> um, there were, I think it was 31 Republicans who broke rank with the Republican Party and voted not to impeach Bill Clinton. Are you expecting any kind of defection on that scale tonight from either side? No, although I think part of that may reflect that this is arguably the shortest investigation uh, of a presidential impeachment to go to the Senate. And that does have an impact on, on polling and the public's view. There, it does require a certain period of saturation and maturation within the public to get people to switch sides. This has been a rocket docket of an impeachment. Uh, the Democrats said they're gonna impeach by Christmas. Uh, many of us said, you need to slow down, that this record is incomplete. It's the thinnest record ever to go to the Senate in a presidential impeachment, and it will most certainly fail. And so, you know, I was glad that they dropped the four crimes I testified against uh, as a basis for impeachment. They went forward with the two I thought were viable, but they're still going forward with a vote before they have a record. And that's going to make it very easy for the Senate Republicans. They can give as cursory a trial as the Democrats had as cur a cursory investigation. And they're inviting that to happen. Elizabeth, uh, what have the Democrats gained politically? Uh, put aside a little for a moment. I just want to ask you with a political hat on. What have the Democrats gained politically from this process, do you think? Well, I think they are showing the American people that they are the party that will stand up for American values of democracy, the idea that checks and balances apply in our government and that our elected leaders should be looking out for the American people and the national security of the United States and not looking 
when they're on the world stage especially, to go after their own personal political gain, as we saw here with President Trump and the Ukrainian government, or as we've seen in other instances with this president, using the leverage of the office of the presidency to line his own pocket through um, doing deals through his businesses with foreign governments across the world. I think that the Democrats in the House are sending a message to the American people that we want to ensure that our elections are free and fair, free of foreign interference. They want to send a message that no one is above the law. And the record here, I think the investigation was short because there isn't a lot in dispute, really. You know, if you roll up on a crime scene and someone is standing over the body holding the gun saying, I shot him, you know, that's essentially what President well, Trump is saying mm -hmm. here, but it was perfect mm -hmm. and it shouldn't be impeached. That's a different issue. That That is a different issue, although the president has said that he could go on Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and he wouldn't lose supporters. That is certainly a different issue because actually when you look at the evidence, Jonathan Turley, which is what Republicans have been saying and the White House has been saying, this one phrase, for example, Example that came up in the conversation with President Zelensky, do us a favor though. Democrats are saying that us is President Trump, do President Trump a personal favor, but Republicans and the President are saying that us is the United States of America. To what extent does this come down to a question of whether you believe the President acts in good faith or the President acts in bad faith? Well, I think that certainly is the relevant question. My co-witnesses at the hearing said, you can go ahead and base your vote on inferences. My objection was you really don't have to do that when there are at least 10 witnesses that we believe have direct evidence that you didn't go to court to compel their testimony. And that is knowable, not unknowable facts that you can, you can have. The only way that this record is complete and compelling is if you take every contested fact, and they are contested, and just infer it against the president. That doesn't make for an impeachment. If you want to remove an American president and there's evidence to be found, then you have to give up this idea of delivering an impeachment by Christmas like it's the most recent toy on the shelf and actually build a case. Okay, talking of Christmas, the gravity of this situation is lost on no one, not least one Republican lawmaker who even compared the Democrats' case against President Trump to the crucifixion of Jesus. Before you take this historic vote today, one week before Christmas, I want you to keep this in mind. When Jesus was falsely accused of treason, Pontius Pilate gave Jesus the opportunity to face his accusers. During that sham trial, Pontius Pilate afforded more rights to Jesus than the Democrats have afforded this president in this process. My problem with this kind of language is not that it's flowery and over the top, etc. It's that when you speak in that kind of an extreme, Elizabeth, you basically turn off voters of either sides from all of politics in Washington because they say they've just gone, they've jumped the shark, they've gone over the top. Well, I have a lot of problems with that kind of language. Um, and, you know, I think what you say is, is just one of them, but that is certainly um, something that I think is true. You know, this is certainly a political moment. We've seen it in language like that, but it's also a constitutional moment for the ages. And it's a time where we have to say, you know, look, we have a president who has, um, you know, his view is that his call was perfect. We have sworn testimony on the record that there was a quid pro quo from Ambassador Sondland in particular. And the question is, is this impeachable? And our elected leaders have to come into Congress and say whether or not they think it's an impeachable offense. Um, my opinion as a constitutional lawyer is that it certainly is. The founders were deeply afraid of foreign corruption, particularly in our elections, and that the president would use his office to corruptly stay in office and therefore rendering the ballot box our yeah, usual think, check on elected leaders I think you had just got rid of some that. strange foreign power when the founders brought up the Well, I was, actually, <laughs> I was actually at that trial that as, as well with Pontius Pilate. But, um, uh, <laughs> I but, thought you were there with the Salem witches. I, I was. I looked a lot younger. But I will note that they had full access to witnesses, um, which is, is a point that you know, one has to consider. Okay, Jonathan Turley, Elizabeth Wider, it is good on a day like this to be able to find a moment where we can have a little bit of humor. <laughs> like, let's on this go back to our serious. panel, Elizabeth Wider and Jonathan Turley for their final thoughts as the House of Representatives starts its process of voting Jonathan Turley to impeach Donald Trump. What impact does this have uh, on America? Well, I, I think it's going to be an almost universally negative impact because I think the House has failed to make its case. They could have. They could have built a real case. I mean, when you talk about, well, will it ever win in the Senate, 
They made it easy by not pursuing these witnesses. They could have gotten some of these witnesses. Some of these witnesses may have established a quid pro quo, but they didn't. And so what they have is a divisive vote with a record that doesn't support, doesn't establish that these offenses occurred. And more importantly, by not calling these witnesses, they have allowed the Senate to say, okay, you didn't think they were necessary, neither do we, and the night is over. Elizabeth, what do you think this has, an, what impact do you think this has on Donald Trump himself? Mm. Yes, well, you know, first I disagree with John about the record, um, but I think that, you know, this is obviously about Donald Trump and his abuse of his office and his refusal to allow witnesses to testify and his blanket refusal to cooperate with Congress and any of their legitimate constitutionally obligated oversight responsibilities. But I think it's not just about President Trump and his abuse of office, it's about the presidents to come after this. And what this moment is about is showing that there are consequences when you brazenly violate the Constitution by selling out American interests to foreign interests, when you decide that the checks and balances that are in the Constitution won't apply to you. So it's about President Trump and his place in history, and it's about ensuring that American democracy can continue. Okay, Elizabeth Wider, Professor Johnson Turley, thank you very much for joining me on this very busy day here in Washington, D.C.